So I was reflecting on this time of year, and I spoke last week about gifts and giving. I thought the greatest gift that a parent could give a child is the present of presence. And what I mean by that is being present with your children. That's what we all crave, really, isn't it? Presence. I recall when I was younger, I was involved in athletics, basically, from the time I could walk until even now. And the one thing I craved more than victory, although I did crave victory, obviously, you want to win or else why play, was to have my dad there and to have my mom there to watch me play. And I remember being on the football field, American football, hundreds. We weren't very good at Algonac, where we less. But hundreds, close to 1,000 people watching us play, and I could hear my dad's voice over everybody's. Usually because he was yelling at me about something. What'd you fumble for? Or way to go? Or something. But I could hear his voice because I craved it. I was listening for it. Oh, man, I hope dad's here today. And, you know, my childhood was far from perfect. I don't know anybody who was. But the one thing I always remember is my parents were present as much as they could. And I was so thankful for that. And I remember visiting with a family a while ago. And I always, whenever I go to a family's house, I know this is weird, but I always watch the interaction between the mom and the dad and the children just because it's fun, just to see how they interact with each other. And I remember... This little boy, the youngest, just following his daddy around the house. Everywhere he went, it's like he was in his back pocket almost. And I just thought it was the great. He just wanted to be near him, wherever he was. And we were talking and fellowshipping, and it came time for bed, and the little boy came up. Daddy, will you come read me a story before bed? He's like, of course I will. Sure, yeah. And his eyes got like this big. He just wanted to be with his daddy. Just to spend time with him to be present. And I did some research, as I'm prone to do, and I, the census.gov put out a survey, post survey results. Living with two parents has historically been the nation's most common living arrangement. And in 1968, about 60 million or 85% of all US children live, under 18 lived with both parents. By the time the census came out, the same question in 2020, that went down from 60 million to 51.3 million, or 15% drop. Living with one mother only is the second most common living arrangement. In 1968, 7.6 million, or 11% of all children, lived with only their mother, compared to 2020, 15.3 million. Or 21 percent with father only is the least common 0.8 million in 1968 four point or one percent in 2020 it was 4.5 percent or 3.3 million and even there's even numbers for just living with no parents or grandparents or what other living arrangement 1968 two million people two million children or three percent of all of them and it's gone up a million to 2020, 3 million or 4.7%. Being present, it's very important. And we see, if you want to extrapolate a little bit how our society is affected by living arrangements, parents being present, and so forth. Because as humans, we crave shared experiences. We crave interaction with each other. By nature, we crave relationship. Even an introvert, extrovert, there's a common bond for a desire for shared experiences. When I was in 1998, I visited my first ever international trip. I went to, with a group of folks from Starville, we went to Spain and then we spent for a week and then we spent a weekend in London where our dear Mr. Humphreys gave us a guided tour of, of London, walked us around I don't think our tour guide showed up and he said, I'll do it. <laughs> showed us around and it was awesome. We had a great time and we still talk about it whenever we get together. 
But there was something different when my wife and I were planning to go because she had never been in 2019 when we went back. And I was like, I can't wait to share this experience with her, seeing Big Ben for the first time and seeing all of these things in the museum of, for the first time. Shared experiences. We went to the Cliffs of Moher in, in Galway in Ireland and just stood there holding each other's hand, looking at probably the most beautiful thing we'd ever seen. Just a, an amazing experience that we shared together. Well, it turns out humans are driven by shared experiences, and it's backed up by medical research and facts. The National Institute of Health published in the National Library of Medicine a study, a study that they did with wanting without enjoying the social value of sharing experiences with each other. The result was they found through medical backing of things up that even if there wasn't any kind of tangible increase or a tangible or even a monetary increase, people would generally lean towards sharing an experience with someone, even if they felt no benefit or monetary gain out of it, because they just wanted to have that social connection. Think of the best dessert you've ever had, right? And you're with your friends, you go, oh man, you got to taste this, right? <laughs> you got to taste this. It tastes so good. We just want to share with each other. So we're going to start this morning by thinking about the shared presence, the present of presence. And look at Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Very common portion of scripture this time of year. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But when he thought on these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, the wife, for that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Ghost. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all, now all this was done, that it might fulfill prophecy which was spoken of the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. <coughs> Joseph, being raised from the, from the sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, took his wife unto him, and knew her not until she brought forth his firstborn son, and they called his name Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. The first name that we get about our Savior is translated, God with us. Now, it might seem obvious or very clear or blunt, but the Almighty God, the Almighty One, the All-Powerful, became God with us. Because He wants to be with us, doesn't He? He wants relationship. It's an amazing thought that God wants to be with us for all of eternity. Now think about the last, going on three years now. Everything's kind of been isolated and locked down, and we've been spending a lot more time with our family, you know, a small group of people, even not even going into work, just working from home. You're around each other constantly. And I'll tell you what, I got a little stir crazy. Even I got sick of being around myself, <laughs> right? I got sick of being around myself. Man, I got to get out. I got to walk or do something. But God never gets sick of us. He wants to be around us forever. God with us. Now, he came to earth in human form. We know that. He was tempted in all points just like we were. And we can underestimate the human aspect of Christ sometimes. We think of him as God, and of course, God in the flesh, but he had human, he was all human, just like he was all God, all at the same time. The human aspects of Jesus craving relationship, interaction with his family, with his disciples, you see it throughout the scripture, the relationship, the driving force, because he was human, right? Another good Christmas verse, Philippians 2, 5 through 8. 
Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto the death of the cross. He became the untouchable, all-knowing, all-powerful God, became touchable and approachable in his human form. All-powerful God, the omnipresent God, became present. He downsized himself into, as Pastor Karim always used to say, into an embryo. He confined himself into a body, the all-present, all-powerful God. The all-powerful God became a helpless baby so he could be to earth, come to earth and be with us. He came, became sin, even though he knew no sin, so that we could become the righteousness of God. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Give me all your sin, and I'll give you all my righteousness. That's, that was his purpose on earth, a part of it anyway. And these are all true and important points about the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the transformation, the, 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 the thing that, was, that happened to exchange his righteousness, his, his righteousness for our sin. All of that is wonderful. But when I read through Scripture, and it's all true, and we could talk about that for ages, but when I read through Scripture, the thing I see most is presence. From Genesis to Revelation. Genesis 3, verse 8 and 9. Even in the Garden of Eden, the first interaction of God and man, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But when the Lord God called to them, he said, where are you? He was looking for Adam and Eve. There was an established pattern here, a daily habit, it seems, of walking and communing with Adam and Eve. And when they sinned, they knew that they could no longer, they were afraid, so they hid from his presence. They hid themselves. And from that point, man's been trying to get back to that relationship, the presence. And only through Jesus Christ is that possible. And that leads to the first prophecy of Christ in Genesis 3.15, when he's talking to the serpent. He says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, speaking of Christ, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. From that point forward, man is trying to get back into the very presence of God that relationship that he desires. Moses in Exodus 33, 13 through 16. <clears throat> now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, he's praying this to God. This is a few short verses away from it's where it says Moses spoke with God as a man speaks with a friend. He says, if I have found favor in your sight, show me now your ways that I might know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And God said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Moses says in, in reply, verse 15, if your presence does not go with me, do not bring us up here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? It is not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth. His presence distinguishes us from everyone else. The fact that he's with us, that he goes with us, that he is communing and having that relationship with us. What a blessed thing. And that's the first name that he was known as, announced to his earthly mother and father, Emmanuel, God with us. David desired it throughout. Read the Psalms, read Samuel, read it all. Psalm 27, 4, one thing have I desired of all things, all other things that I will seek after, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord 
and inquire in his temple. At this point, David wasn't king. He was told he was going to be king. He's running for his life. And he says, not one thing I desire, make me king. Not one thing I desire, save me from these guys who are trying to kill me. He says, one thing above all else, I just want to be where you are, in your presence. He's reminding the Lord later on in the same chapter, verses 7 through 9, Psalm 27. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, O Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, O you who have been my help. Cast me not off, forget, forsake me not. O God of my salvation, he says, when you told me to seek your face, I cried out and said, I will seek your face. That's what I'm doing, so please don't cast me away from that. One of the prayers he prayed years later after he sinned, Psalm 5111, cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. That's what he desired the most, was just being in God's presence. And he had a glimpse of that in his temple, in his tabernacle, the little tent, and all it was was the Ark of the Covenant to sit and be in God's presence. God's presence from Genesis all the way through Revelation. He opens and closes the book of Matthew with it. Consider this. Matthew 1, 23, we just read it. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Go all the way to the end of the book. Matthew 28, verse 20. He's giving his great commission, the last part of it, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. He starts by saying, God with us, and he leaves them saying, I'm with you always. Presence. That's what he wants. That's what he desires. And it's such a great gift. The greatest gift of all, right? The present of his presence. Revelation 14.1. Talk, you can take this all the way through Revelation, folks. Revelation 14.1. <clears throat> And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, the lamb, capital L. And with him, 144,000, having his names written in their foreheads. And later on it says, they follow him wherever he goes. They follow him wherever he goes, with him. That's where you want to be. That's where I want to be. That's where we all want to be, I'm sure. End of Revelation. Revelation 21, verse 3. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men. He will live with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He came to our place. He took our place. And he invites us back into his place. Right? He came to our place to earth. He took our place. And then he invites us back to his place where we can dwell and be with him for all of eternity. The very last book of the Bible the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen? Be with him. That's where I want to be. That, to me, is the greatest gift. That, to me, is the story of Scripture. There's a lot of other things you could talk about, redemption and all of that, the purging of heaven and all of that, but it's about relationship. It's about his presence, being in his presence. Going back to Moses for just a minute, <clears throat> He said in Exodus 33, 16, For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? That's how we distinguish ourselves from everyone else. That's what Moses is saying. How else will anybody know unless you do go with us? His presence distinguishes us. Now, I'd like to share a, an excerpt from uh, a writing called The Manifest Presence of God. It was a, a recording of uh, someone named Walter Butler's uh, experiences. I, I think some of us have heard of them at least once or twice. He was instructed by God to fly from London to Amsterdam with no explanation. God just said, buy a ticket and go on New Year's Eve. He originally, he balked and he said, but Lord, I want to be with my family on New Year's Eve. He said, just buy the ticket and go. He was not giving any further instructions. So he buys a ticket and he goes. <clears throat> he lands in Amsterdam and says, Father, this is the airport in Amsterdam. I am here. 
unless you speak, I will go into the city, check into a hotel, and tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, I'll buy a ticket and go back home. He gets to his hotel and he says, Father, here I am in the hotel. I've checked in. If I don't hear anything from you, tomorrow morning I'm going to buy a ticket and I'll go home. In the morning he was up early and he prayed, Father, I'm still here and I'm getting ready to go to the airport unless you speak. And the Lord didn't speak. So he says he went back to the airport and bought a British Airlines ticket back to London. And as he's sitting there waiting, he gets on the plane and they're told that there's tremendous fog around the airport and they're unable to take off. Will all the passengers please return to the terminal as there's heavy fog? And he went into the lounge and there he says, an overwhelming enveloping presence of God came upon me. And what a presence it was. Within and without, I was in a cloud of God's presence. A spirit of worship and prayer came upon me. So I found a comfortable chair in a corner and sat there. There was such an intense presence that I sat in an attitude of worship and prayer and completely lost track of everything else. After some time, he says, I thought I should check and see about that flight. He was amazed that it was now one o'clock in the afternoon after being... 8 o'clock in the morning when he got there. He walked over to the window and the fog was still so heavy he couldn't see. And they canceled all flights. So he goes back to his chair and that presence returns. And all he says, all I wanted to do was sit there. And he shut his eyes and began to commune and then he's interrupted by a man. He says, sir, tell me your secret. He opened his eyes, surprised. And he sees a man sitting across from him. He says, tell me your secret. He says, I've been watching you all morning in this chair. What is that glowing light on your face? And he says, what light? He didn't even know what he was talking about. He said, you had a light on your face. And I wonder to myself if what you had is what I am seeking. Please tell me your secret. He says, I was, he was a man from Eastern Africa. He was raised in in the the Muslim religion, and then he left that because he wasn't happy, and he tried all these other religions, he says, and I left all religion. I just gave up because I couldn't find anything, but you seem to have what I'm looking for. Show me what your secret is. So Brother Butler, of course, expounds and shares with him. And I've read this account many times, and I've used it as an illustration in other sermons before. And each time something new comes out, And this, you could talk about God's providence leading him there and all of that, but the thing that struck out to me in the the perspective of this message was he waiting on God, waiting in his presence, taking advantage of being in his presence. It's a gift to us. Do we wait on him and just listen sometimes? He was just listening to God. Just He didn't speak at all, he says. He just sat there. Waiting on God. It teaches us dependence on him. And there is silence coming before God in his presence and silently sitting. Just listen. David was an expert at this. 46.10, Psalm 46.10, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Psalm 62.1, My soul waits upon God. From him comes my salvation. Pastor Daniel was sharing about knowing the times, knowing the seasons, and one of them was a time to be silent. And there was also the time to speak. How often do we just enjoy sitting in his presence? That's what he gives us. He gives us time. And the great thing is, is he's infinite. He's got all the time that we could ever ask for. Sitting, meditating, coming with expectation even. I hope. What will you speak to me today? We won't read it for the sake of time, but in Exodus 24, God speaks to Moses and says, come up and I'll give you the law and so forth. So immediately Moses goes up. Now, did God speak to Moses right away? No, it took him six days where he's sitting there. Okay, Lord, I'm here. (laughs) Brother Butler, the same thing. I'm here. If you speak, imagine the time frame. it's, It's a short story, but he got there. It's, it's, I'm going to check into a hotel, spent the night, got up early so he could pray and hear what the Lord would say. Nothing. 
just waiting for the Lord to speak. Just waiting for the Lord to speak. Does his presence distinguish us from other people? It's not about the Bible thumping. It's not about the message. It's not about the Jesus fish on the back of our car. It's about his presence. Moses literally glowed. He had to wear a veil. Otherwise, the people wouldn't be able to look at him. Jesus, when he was transfigured, came down from the Mount of Transfiguration and his face was shining. His clothes were white like light. So what a joy it is to know Emmanuel, God with us. What a gift. The present of presence. From the beginning of time until the end of time, God has desired to be with his people in intimate relationship, sharing experiences with him, waiting in his presence. Even if you are one of those statistics that I read earlier, without a father, without a mother, he can be with you always. Even if you had the great, greatest family life ever, he still is with you always. That's been his desire. He never grows tired of being around us. Never grows tired of being in his presence. So do we desire desire to be with him? Do we appreciate the present of his presence?